It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing the legend, Patrick Bauer, president <laughs> and CEO of Heartland Dental that has probably eight or 900 offices. Pat joined Heartland Dental in April of 1997, bringing over 23 years of experience in dental and healthcare operations management to the company. As president and CEO, he is responsible for the oversight and management of all operations and day-to-day -day functions of the company. A certified instructor for the Advanced Achievement Leadership Program with Dr. Gerald Bell at the University of North Carolina, Pat is committed to building and promoting professional as well as personal growth for all um, Heartland Dental Care affiliated doctors and team members. He was the founding president of the American Academy of Dental Group Administrators, uh, which is right here in my backyard. Uh, they're uh, uh, right up the street here in Phoenix. And, um, and then he is a uh, certified trainer for the Vantage Institute. Um, he attended Concordia College. And Pat, I just, uh, I love it um, when you come on the show because here's a dentist living in one office, probably 75, what would you say, 70% of dentists are solo practitioners by themselves? Probably still 70%, yeah, 70, 75, yeah. And they're, they wear so many hats and they're, they're barely trying to do what they do in one office. And here they have the opportunity to listen to a guy like you who's been in dentistry as long as I have, we're the same age. Uh, we're both born in 62, even, look, even though I look like I'm your older fat brother, uh, we're actually <laughs> the same age. It must be your hair. And um, I, what I want to do is get you on the show for two reasons. Number one, what could you, what have you learned to manage? How many offices are you guys up to now? About 915. 915. So that's about 914 more offices than everybody listening on this uh, show. And, and, and like say, you, you've been in practice management in dentistry. You were a founding member of the American Academy of Dental Group Administrators. I wanted to get you on um, to what, what have you learned running 915 offices that my homies could, could take advantage of and, and help with their one? Well, uh, it's a pretty good question because we talk about it quite a bit. All, all we are is a collection of offices but each one is its own micro site that is just like any other solo practitioner. So we're locally branded. So all of our offices have a local brand name and act as their own small dental practice. So our biggest practice is probably McKinneyDentist.com. I don't know if you've heard of them, but uh, Marvin Berlin in uh, McKinney, Texas, and they are four doctors. We have one in, in Virginia, Maryland area, actually that has maybe four doctors, but the rest of them are one, two doctor practices. So they're just like any other solo practitioner out there. And what we do is support them so that they can be successful in the communities they serve. It's not complicated. It gets more complicated when you have scale and large, but in the end, it's about how we service and help that doctor be as successful as he can be or she can be in the location that they're in. So it's literally a solo practice. We have our whole team is there to help them. What do you want to accomplish, doctor? What do you want to do? What kind of dentistry do you want to do? We force them to write, what are their goals? And then we, we really help them get it. So it's, even though we're 910 offices, we practice as if we're one practice 915 times, if that makes sense. And so all we're trying to do, my, I mean, I wake up every day and it's very simple. <laughs> all I have to do is figure out how to support our doctors and their team members in the community that they serve so they can deliver the highest quality dental care and experiences to the patients they see, period. But it, it seems more complicated because we're big and we're corporate and we've got a legal team, but I've got a legal team to help our doctors. I've got a, uh, 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 you know, a, a marketing team to help our doctors. They understand the patience of those doctors so they can get the kind of patients um, they want to see in the communities they serve. So we're locally branded. We're in, my customer is a dentist. And so a dentist, our dentist customers typically want to be in a middle to upper middle class suburb where they can practice on the kind of patients they want to practice on. We see no HMO. We see one, less than 1% Medicaid, and that's by choice for those doctors that see it. So we're pretty much uh, lots of, uh, we have lots of practices that don't take any insurance. So it's, it's whatever that doctor wants, we can help them because all the back office stuff comes off their back so they can concentrate on really taking care of the patients they want to see. So that's a long answer for a short question, but that's all we do. It's not, it's not as complicated as people think. So, um, so you support them in what 
what would you say? Uh, HR, legal, marketing, or oh yeah, should I not all those it? things? You're just well, what what, what all those things? things you HR, just, legal, marketing. So, is it accounting? Accounting, okay. accounts payable. Uh, you know, maintenance if they need help. All of the things that distract them from taking a care of pa their patients, we can take care of on the backside. What we also have is the luxury to be able to help them in their practice in a consultative approach. So if you think about, uh, you you know, Goldstein, Garber, and Salama are. You know who uh, John Cranham is, who runs the Dawson Academy. Um, these are people that are, are affiliated with us. So they have some of the best dentists they can get the best advice from at the same time, plus our systems work. So our systems on how a practice can be developed. So we hire, last year we hired probably 170 brand new grads. And so we're able to give them the kind of training, not only clinical, but leadership and how a system works within a dental office so they can take care of the patients the best way they can. So we're just have, we have both best of both worlds. I can take that, the, the burden of, of the uh, back office stuff and I have enough experts that can help them within their practice that they're, while they're running it. So I've got the best of both worlds to help our doctors be the best they can be. How many dental, dental students did you hire last year? 170-ish. 170-ish. Is the yeah. is, is this 170 ish is because one of them was Irish and you're not sure whether to count yeah. as a whole person <laughs> exactly. or a half. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, um, I, I don't have data. I could lie. <laughs> you know, I, I this is dentistry uncensored, and, and I I like to just tell like this because I'm not on this show to make friends. I'm on this show to tell them. You know, their their, their own father would tell them what they really thought, and uh, mm -hmm. only a, a schmuck would tell them what they want to hear. Um, when I was. Uh, graduated 31 years ago, uh, the only people that were higher associates was the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. And now mm -hmm. I really commend uh, Heartland for hiring 170 graduates, because I'll tell you the truth, I, I don't want them. I, I've tried them over the years. You know, it, uh, it takes them an hour and a half to do an MOD filling, and then it falls out a year later. Um, and, and and I'll tell you what, I have, um, I have you know, dental associates are tough. Um, the, you know, the millennials, they change jobs a lot. They have a lot of high turnover, but I'm convinced from my podcast and my data that you uh, keep your uh, dental students the longest, mainly because they tell me that they have so much access to continue education. I mean, I, I've had so many Heartland dentists on this show. We've done 1200 episodes and they come on and say, oh my wow. God, Heartland said if I stayed with them five years, I'd get my FAGD. I could get my diplomat in the International Congress for Implantology. And they, they went there because of the mentorship opportunities available mm -hmm. of something that scale of 900 offices that old farmer Joe Dennis in Parsons, Kansas might not be able to offer them. That's, that, that's exactly right. I mean, I just got off the phone with Steve Thorne because he's got the same problem. He doesn't probably hire as many new graduates from Pacific Dental Services, but we're all trying to figure out how can we help our doctors get the learning curve sooner rather than later? Why does it have to go slow? Why can't we help them be better dentists faster, give them access to the right education faster so they become better to the com communities they serve faster? And that's all we're trying to do. Rick, Rick, long time figured out, you know what? It doesn't have to be this hard. Why is it so hard for a solo practitioner? It shouldn't be this hard. And if we can set up the systems properly to train them the way most dentists would want to be trained, give them the right clinical, not only clinical, but also leadership, because you know that's what makes a difference in a practice, um, and, and, and do it faster. That's all That's all we're trying to do. And so we, we they can get 200 CE units their first year. I mean up to that moment. And, and I can also vouch, you know, um, your um, founder, Rick Workman, he was on uh, episode, he, he was one of the first guys I podcast. He's episode 37 and on YouTube, which our YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash Dentaltown Magazine. Hell, he had 3000 views and Steve mm -hmm. Thorne, who you're talking about with Pacific Dental Care had a thousand views. And uh, both of those guys have flown out here and seen me before. I. I love those guys. They're some of the best guys in dentistry, and uh, they, they really are. I mean, look at Steve Thorne. He, he went to a, a dental missionary, and his wife adopted two kids. I mean, how, how, yes. <laughs> how cool is that? I mean, not many dentists take their it's wife amazing. on a missionary trip and come back with uh, two children. Um, but, um, <laughs> it, it's, but you guys are in the limelight, so if you climb the pole the highest, everybody throws arrows at you, and I, I always see it the opposite. I mean, like, like when we started uh, Dental Town Online CE, well, that wasn't my idea. I'm in Phoenix, and I was watching University of Phoenix just exploding, and after about the 10th mm -hmm. patient that came in working for University of Phoenix Online, 
in 2006 when I thought, oh, well, uh, I guess I'll start that. <laughs> and now we have, you know, 400 classes with a million views, um, all 88. Per so I always steal from the smartest people. And if you and Rick Workman aren't the smartest people, um, then Steve Thorne has got to be, you know, right behind you. Um, um, Rick Workman was. Well, episode we do the same thing. Rick, Rick has stolen things his whole life, and so have I. I mean, I, all you do is you keep going out there and you try to figure out what's working and what's not working. Um, whether it be, you know, what are we learning from KKR? What are we learning from all the people we ha have that can help our doctors be better? That's all we do. We're not, again, we're not, we're, we're smart people. I'm not saying we're not smart, but we're not dumb enough to think that we create everything on ourselves. We just keep on copying genius. If it worked in another, you know, when would we start using headsets? After I believe you said you should use headsets in your offices because only the best stores in America use headsets. If you want to help your patients better, you wear headsets. So all of our offices wear headsets. Now, do I get doctors who go, I don't want to wear a headset. Well, if you don't want to be world-class in helping your patients, that's up to you. But world-class people communicate better, and that's why they wear headsets in their ears, not to irritate you or your ear, but to help patients and help you help your patients. And so that's why I, I can't say all of them wear them, but we do that because we listen to smart people and say, if that works, why wouldn't we do it everywhere? And another thing I like about uh, Harlan is every time I've gone to Effingham, Illinois, man, you've kept the same people for decades. Like how long have you been there? Yeah. I've been there 21 years. Yeah, and my, Started my, when we had eight, eight practices. And, and my Lori's been there 20 years, I mean, you know, and, and that shows you to be young doctors. Think I'll, I'll tell you my d dirty, dark secrets. I mean, my dental office is 31 years, but my five key management people have been there 20 years. So for 11 years, I didn't right. delegate. I didn't attract and retain who I should have. I tried to do everything myself. And it took me 11 years of going down the highway at 150 miles an hour, driving off the road every six months and doing U-turns and flipping around <laughs> and and uh, before you get your head on straight. I, I wanna ask you a question. You, you mentioned Aspen Dental. Um, why do you local brand instead of rolling out a national brand like uh, like Aspen Dental or uh, didn't Pacific Dental, they brand all their stores Pacific Dental, don't they? Uh, they're kind of regional. I think they're a regional brand. I think they have a regional brand. It has something to do with modern dentistry or something because, in, in a regional area. Yeah, kind of like Kroger. Like Kroger, lots of people don't realize Kroger is one of the biggest grocery stores in the world, but in Kansas, they're called Dillon's. Out here, they're called Fry's. Yeah. They got some called... There's one actually called Hinky Dinky, if you can believe that. But why did you choose local brand strategy instead of national brand strategy? Well, it starts with who's our customer. So our customer is a dentist. And what we realized early on is the dentist that we were trying to attract didn't want a brand name across all of them. They wanted to be their own dentist in the communities that they serve. And so we call it, kind of said early on that we're a collection of hometown offices where we did a lot of affiliation. From 97 to early 98, we did almost all affiliations, acquisitions. And then in 98, 99, we started doing more de novo or strat, scratch start practices. And then we ended up doing a mix. And so when we do an affiliation, they don't want to change their name to a brand. They want their still their local, their local um, communicate community connection. And so the research we've done on all patients is they like patients choose their dentist based upon community convenience, and then about 25% to 30% of the time, the doctor referral. But otherwise, they're looking for community and convenience. And so when you have a community name, it's, it's, it's attached to the community. Today, we believe patients choose their dentist that way. And today, we believe dentists would rather have that and have our support so they can tell their mom and dad, look, this is my practice. I got Heartland's help, but look, it doesn't say Heartland anywhere. It's really my practice because I run it. And that's the, the value that we bring to doctors that, that we just don't think we need to. Will that change someday, Howard? I don't know. Probably not in my lifetime, probably not while I'm here, but maybe someday, you know, there was a, there's a large group in, in England, there were 600 offices and uh, they just ended up going to a brand called My Dentist, but they were locally branded, but they didn't have any brands that went bad. So we had some bad, some brands that were kind of gave bad reputations, not Aspen. I don't, I, I feel sorry for Aspen because they get beat up. I think they do a great job, but they get beat up because they're one brand. Uh, but I have 900 web uh, FaceTime, Facebook pages. I have, you know, 900 web pages that I have to manage. So it causes somewhat more trouble, but that's what my customer wants. So we're just really answering to what our customer wants. Our, our, our dentist customer wants that more. What year did Heartland Dental start? That's Heartland 1997. 
1997. And yeah. when did you join them? What year? 1997. We had eight practices when I started. You 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 started in 97 too? Yeah. The first year they I started? started in 97. Yeah. So now Rick had Workman Management Group before that, okay. and he sold 21 offices um, approximately because they're a little bit, and then started over with eight. That's when I came in. And so he was, it was called Workman, yeah, in 97, yeah. Okay, so um, let's let's go back to de novo or purchase. What 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 makes you start at de novo from scratch versus uh, acqu mergers and acquisitions and purchase of an existing? Um, because you can put them in the location that you want to put them, where today's uh, consumer will recognize them. So we're typically a standalone dental office um, in a very nice retail area where hundreds and hundreds of cars, thousands, go by them with big signage, 10 to 12 chairs, two doctors that get up to 200 new patients a month right away. Okay, so because go, of go the through their questions. So and it's gonna be good for 20, it's gonna be good for 20 to 30 years. Th that, that's for your M&A activity and ac acquiring a purchase, you want 10 that's to 12. That's a de novo, that's a de novo. Oh, de novo. That's a de novo, so okay. a de novo, that's a de novo. Where, why, do we, why, why do we build a de novo and where do we put them? We put them in a retail area where we know they're gonna be good for 20 to 30 years. So if you look at most dental offices, they're hidden. So when we're doing affiliations, they're not necessarily in the best locations. They're usually hidden, but they already have a patient base. So the differences between the two is one has cash flow. <laughs> so that's the affiliation, the acquisition. And the doctor, we want them to stay. We expect them to stay a minimum of 200, or excuse me, two years. And then we have the de novo that has no cash flow. Um, it's, it's less expensive to buy it typically um, than buying it, but it's gonna be good for 25 to 30 years in that particular location. So there, that's the, the trade-off is that the, the actual cash on cash return is a little bit higher on, on de novos, but it's pretty close, if that makes sense. So when you do de novo, um, do demographics matter? Oh yeah, they absolutely matter. We don't put them where we don't think, one, they need a dentist in the area. We're not gonna put them in a highly competitive area. We're gonna put them in an area where we think they need dentists in that area. We know the demographics. We know the exactly the households that we're going to. So we use a proprietary tool that's used by a big, Big, bigger companies that big boxes use to say, here's our demographics of our patients where we're successful, of Heartland's uh, affiliated offices where they're successful. And then what is the demographics and does that particular marketplace match with the demographics that we're looking for? And then we find that that corner that matches those demographics and that's where we put them right there. And we did 46, we did 47 last year. 47 de novos. Brand new, yeah. So on your demographics, what's the doctor per population ratio? It has to be higher than 1,700, but it's not just that. We want it to be above 2,000, but that's not always the case. But it's not just that ratio, it's also there's a com competitive index. In other words, how far away are they from where we are? Um, it's not just zip code, it's where do people drive from? How far will they drive to us? Um, you know, we know our average pet patient drives about 18, 19 minutes away. That's that's how what our patients drive. So we're looking in that particular circle. What what is it, and how many of those different we call them tier one, two, tier tier three patients? Where where will they come, and how will they find us? And so uh, we are able then to study. Now, remember, Howard, 20, 15, 20 years ago, <laughs> we said, oh, there's a target there. How about we put it right by the target? <laughs> Now we're more sophisticated than that today, but back in the day, and we'd be wrong every once in a while. We'd be wrong because the demographics weren't right. There was too much competition. We didn't realize it because we only used that one metric. That's a pretty good metric, but there's other metrics. Um, it could be uh, it, it could be how far the drive time. I mean, this, it's just a bunch of different, and then you have to still go with your gut. So then we, we evaluate everyone that they bring to us, Rick and I are on the committee, and we look at everyone to decide if that's really one we want to take a chance on or not. And you, so we're gonna build. We'll do sixty this year. And, and you like them to be two dentists? Is that for um, yeah. the the um, well in, in MBA school they called the the Mack truck theory. They said you know when they were studying the sixty thousand personal bank. You know when people say the government is incompetent. I mean free enterprise has sixty thousand bankruptcies a year. So people are people. 
and you can't yeah. say that all the people in government aren't good in business and all the people in business are. But um, when they look at those 6,000 um, um, businesses that go failure, a lot of them are great businesses that just ran out of cash. They didn't cash flow. They were yeah, they were right. incurring costs today and not getting paid for 90 days and not enough cash hang on. Another one is the big the Mack truck theory where um, one employee quit, moved, died, whatever, and it caused them to fail. Does, does two dentists, is that more for in case some, in, in case one dentist gets ran over by a Mack truck, you got another dentist in there until you get someone in? Is it more Mack truck theory or is it more to cover more hours of the 168 hours a week? It's to cover more hours and patient flow. So we typically get so many, t- you know, every doctor would love to have 200 new patients right away. And then you just basically, they're just falling all over you. And it's really easy to get some case acceptance. But what happens is, is that it, that with two, you actually treat them better. You, their experience is better. And so we want that experience better. We typically start with three hygienists as well. So we're going three hygienists, two doctors, you know, three dental assistants, three BAs. I mean, we're fully in because so say it um, again two, no, do we, two dentists three rdh what was the rest of the formula yep three dental assistants potentially sometimes four and then three business assistants receptionists what, whatever you want to call them we call them business assistants and an office manager basically pr- practice manager we call it and so we're, we're thinking we're going to get loaded with new patients and that process because a new patient is so volatile man you've got to be careful and you got to be on your game so they got to practice the systems practice their communication because these guys typically we typically put a more experienced doctor in with a young doctor so we don't put two doc two young doctors in we have sometimes have no choice but most of the times we don't and if i can get an experienced doctor in there with the young doctor it goes a lot better because the treatment planning goes a lot better how they treat the patient goes a lot better they know what they're doing and so we have a whole integration team de novo integration team that works with them for the first really 90 days before they move on to the next one and so they're there on site helping them with their systems on how do you how do you process and take care of a patient the best way you can Oh, that was so it's a that, whole system that man. brought back so many romantic memories for me. So my dad owned five Sonic drive-ins in Wichita and then uh-huh. he had one in uh, Childress, Texas, um, Abilene, Kansas, um, Kearney, Nebraska and Louisville, Kentucky. So my high school years, the summer before uh, the summer between all the high school years, I was on that new startup team. So I spent a <laughs> summer in Childress and my dad left me his Lincoln town car in a hotel <laughs> with everything paid at the desk with a restaurant. So I, when I was in Childress, it was amazing. I was 14 and he left me his Lincoln Continental. And so the <laughs> I got to drive a Lincoln Continental all summer uh, in Childress, Texas without a driver's <laughs> at license. At the age of 14? Oh yeah, back then. I mean, that was a long time ago. Um, you know, it's yeah. those small towns, uh, a farmer needed you uh, to drive. But anyway, um, I really um, had so much fun. So I, I spent a summer in Abilene, Kansas, Kearney, Nebraska, uh, Childers, Texas, and Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, Louisville, Kentucky was the only place I, in my whole life I was ever shot at. I was so oh I was so dumb. <laughs> I, I saw this tobacco fill with this old shed, and I just thought it'd be neat to explore. I had no idea that you don't trespass a tobacco field. And oh, I um, would not have known. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know that. And when I told everybody, but your experience it, in those offices that made a difference, didn't it? They started better because you were there because you knew how they worked. Absolutely. I mean, it, 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 you, we have to have a system that helps these dentists because you know my 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 nephew graduated from University of Pacific with five hundred thousand dollars with student debt. And when he came out, he said, "What should I do?" Because first of all, I talked him into being a dentist because it's great. It's a great career. And and so he went to UOP and he gets out and he goes, where should I go? Well, you should go to a doctor that can help you be successful. And he went with into Wausau, Wisconsin, where Tim Quirt, where I think today it's like 40 below, <laughs> literally. Um, and Tim Quirt is a great mentor. And so he got the best experience. He's, he's just kicking ass and taking care of people and just loving being a dentist. Now he's been out two years and he's just loving it and, and probably one of the best young doctors we have because he's just open positive and mentally flexible so it's a but he couldn't do that on his own he'd be he'd be sucking wind with five hundred thousand dollars with the debt trying to start a practice or be an associate where you don't have patients coming at you he's taking care of his own patients his massive patient base that he has that he can take care of and it's just a it's a win-win for him and win for win for us so back, back to demographics um or some states better than others is rural better than urban um 
And 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 the downside of going rural is it might be it's always harder to find a dentist to go work for you or to sell. So talk about demographics, rural versus urban, or in any any states that you just X out because they're too crowded, and other states that you're. You know, we don't. Want to there there are, there are there are some states that are anti DSO that we step out of. So what are, we don't, what are the anti DSO states? New, New New Jersey doesn't really care for DSOs that much, so we don't. We're not in New Jersey. Um, there are some states that hassle us more. Texas gave us hassle for a while, but you know we we worked that through. We weren't in Washington until just the last year because they were going after Pacific and everybody else until the new laws passed, which was just literally a year ago. Um, we stayed out because Steve was in a battle of his own. We supported him all the way, and and now they've changed the laws, and it's no problem at all. And so we're there, and now we've got already I think ten offices in Washington, somewhere in that range. Um, and so it's there's some states. So there's no from a marketing perspective, it's can we recruit, and what's the competition? So I can't go too rural where I can't recruit somebody, but I don't want to be too urban where there's too much competition. So we've had we've got three. Uh, two affiliations acquisitions in Manhattan. I wouldn't start at Inova there. That just wouldn't be something I would ever do because uh, I don't know the first place about the marketplace. It's very complex. I mean, it, the, the competition is there's so many dentists there. And how do you differentiate yourself? Where if you're in a suburban area where you have, I know the demographics, I know the competition, I can put them there and I can recruit there, then I'm in. So it's it's really about one recruitability. And then, I mean, I have a lot of beautiful practices that come our way that are so urban. And I just look at them and go, good luck. You have a very nice $1.3 million practice that nobody's going to buy unless somebody wants to live here and they buy it from you and your price is going to go down because you have nobody to sell it to. I would buy it if you were 45, 50 miles further into a city, you know, closer to city, but I can't, it's a beautiful practice, but I can't get anybody to work there. So that's that's a real problem for a lot of solo practitioners that are in urban or, or uh, uh, way out uh, area, whatever you so, call it. So so back to demographics as far as the patient, is there a median household income that you like, or years of education? Well, for us, or? for us, our, for for us, we like to be between you know sixty to seventy thousand uh, 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 income wise. There are some people that will be lower than fifty. We just don't think that that works for our demographics, for what our doctors want to see. Uh, sometimes we go higher than that, but we seldom go lower than that. Um, so we're in a in a in a nice um, in a nice area for so, the for so the most sixty part. to seventy thousand. That would be median household income. Household income. Yep. Median. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And um, I, I'm sure everybody listening is thinking, how the heck do you get two hundred new patients a month? What what's hot and what's not in marketing? Is it is it? Do, uh, let me back up before that. Um, do you own your own real estate? Do you like to be in the real estate business or do you prefer to no. rent? We rent everything. You know, so we have one We have one person who uh, owns about 25% of our buildings. And that's a guy you probably know. Dr. Workman also owns a real estate company. So we have one, he builds offices for us as well. So he's kind of my way to have a friendly landlord and a place that I want to build someplace. And he's, so we work and partner well together, but I rent from him. You but 75% of our, not, so yeah, 75% of our, our renters are, I don't know, 900, what would that be, 800 other landlords. So I've got a lot of other landlords, but when I want to build it in a certain area and develop an area, then I'll have him do it. If I do an affiliation and, and the doctor wants to sell his, his property, I'll ask Rick to buy it. Now he doesn't buy them all, so I have to sometimes have a dentist for a landlord. But I don't like to have dentists as a landlord unless it's Dr. Rick Workman because he's a friendly partner. You know, it's so fun. It's funny. The founder of Pizza Hut is Dan Carney, and his wife um, was Beverly. She passed away. Um, but um, I was lucky in my high school. He he was the founder of Pizza Hut, and he's you know he's same hard town, and, and he was so sweet. Um, whenever me and Jim Bell would get a crazy business idea when we were in fourteen. We go to Pizza Hut headquarters and, and he they'd let us in his office and he talked to us forever. And when I got out, I asked him if I should rent this space or build my own building. And he tried so hard to tell me that um, you don't wanna own, you're not in the real estate business, you don't wanna get into that, it's too much debt. He goes, I got a hundred Pizza Hut locations that I can't even give away. 
and just put all your money in the business. And I've seen so many dentists that they come out of school, $400,000 student loans, and then they go buy an acre, and then they spend six months on construction, and the land and buildings like another million, and they, they haven't even got their off zone, but it's something territorial about a, a human being that wants to own the whole ranch, the land, and put a fence around it, but it's really, uh, it's a whole different business. Even um, we had on the show, um, who's the uh, the real estate guru, um, uh, 10 plus, uh, who, who, who's the big real estate guru? Oh, I can't remember. Um, I don't hear it. I, and, I uh, sounded my tongue, but. And he, he was saying um, that, um, that, that it's not even a profitable business until you own about 16 units. And uh, oh, yeah. oh my God, who is that guy? He's, he's the biggest name in the world. I can't think of his name. I, yeah. Um, and um, oh, my son Greg's gonna kill me for not. It's his favorite uh, podcast. <laughs> but anyway, so he he's always saying you're not in the real estate business. Get locations. So would so would you say your locations are pretty retail looking? I mean, are they usually? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, very retail looking. I mean, they're, they're It's a it's, Grant Cardone. You know, most Grant of- Cardone. Oh yeah, he, he's okay. been he's been on the show. I've had him on the show twice because so many dentists are so into that question: should they own or not? And he's saying, you know, like like you have a manager team. Um, if you own real estate, you're gonna need to have you know an office manager. You're gonna have a maintenance guy. You're gonna have the guy. Oh, that, yeah. that, that all these, and you need this nucleus of a couple, two or three key people, and that's not gonna cash flow until you have about sixteen properties. So, so owning your own dental oh. office. Um, and I need I need the cash flow to continue to expand and grow right. my footprint. So I don't need to own the real estate to expand my footprint and the and the and the number of offices that I want to that I want to own or 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 manage. So it's it's a whole process that do I want to use my cash for that or or real estate? And the return on honestly practices is way higher. Right, it's way higher. And that the real that... estate, Rick's Rick's making a good living. Don't get me wrong, but it's not the return that. We get on the on the on the business side. So, yeah, and that 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 and it's risk. There's a lot of risk to it too. So yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. and and but, but so, there's a lot of doctors who do, and then they got their real estate and they think they own something, which is great. But you can own stock in Heartland, and it'll be just as good. So anyway. and never let your money get too far from cash, because another thing dentists understand is liquidity. They'll buy a beach, you know, they'll buy some. Um, nice getaway cabin in the winter, and then when they decide they want to get their money out, they t- find out it takes them three to four years to sell it for 25% less than what they bought it for. <laughs> in fact, I just unloaded my home. I, I was very lucky to unload my home. It was, it was for sale for three years. I mean, I bought that house, had four boys that each had their own bedroom, and then the next thing I know, I'm living in there alone with four one-ton air conditioners. So I put on the market, <laughs> and I, I it, it took three years and I finally had to lower what I purchased it for by a third. And wow. and, and, the, and basically we all agreed, the real estate agent, everybody agreed just, well, at least you got out of it. Um, so, now, right. so now I'm looking for a trailer to move to in uh, one of these trailer park <laughs> communities. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just weird when you're in a 5,000 square foot home by yourself. It just uh, it just seems like this is just too much house. So, so, so um, 200 new patients a month, how the heck do you get that? What, what's the breakdown well, of that of location, direct mail, it, social media? Direct mail still gets the, the, the most quantity, okay? So we do a, a typically, a, you know, $79, let's get acquainted, let, you know, come in and try us, that what kind of thing. What is it, $79, we do, $79, let's get acquainted? Yeah, that kind of a thing. And what's that cover, like an exam and x-rays or? Exam, x-ray and, and uh, and uh, exam, x-ray, exam, x-ray, and cleaning, all three of them. Okay. And what we're trying to do is, is you know, have the patient say, have you ever been treated like this in another practice? That's what that's what the goal is. And so they they need a dental home, and so we're trying to help them find that. So that, but, but the location brings in a lot. So we get a lot. You can't say that they're all walk-ins because they get the ad, they see it, they go to the grocery store, they go to the store, they go somewhere retail, and they go, there's that dental office that just sent me that direct mail or I was looking, my friend said, go look these guys up. And so we do a lot of uh, pay-per-click stuff, a lot of a lot of digital uh, marketing today as well. We probably spend half our money now, used to be a lot less, but we're getting online appointment requests now that three years ago, we never get any. 
So there's now 10% of our patients come on uh, online, um, you know, looking to make an appointment. They're they're actually requesting an appointment 10%, online, which is 10% percent are requesting a patient online at your website. Of all of our new patients, of all of our new patients. And do they do they come from um, direct mail or is that from a digital advertising like Facebook? Typically or, digital. Digital, Typically like what, digital. what kind of digital? Facebook. I'm not the marketing expert, Howard. <laughs> right. Facebook. I mean, they do so many different things. Instagram, and they doing. I mean, they're just doing, you know, just just Google AdWords. I mean, we buy Google AdWords just like everybody else, and we're looking for to be our SEO is really high. When you look for one of our, if you're looking for dental in one of our areas, um, because of the way they're they're going about it, we jump to the top. So there's a lot of things. Again, what you know, you, you talked about internet brands or or WebMD. The whole thing is how do we have the right tools so every dentist out there says, I can't beat Heartland, I might as well join them. And so if I can't be better at all those things and they can do that on their own, they won't want to join me. But if I can show them I have better tools and, and you might as well just come with us because we can both win, you have an exit strategy and you can also practice the way you want to practice with us, why not? Because it's hard. I mean, when, when the state of, when the federal government dropped the plan called, oh, I'm drawing a blank on a plan, but it's um, it's, a, it's the plan for families of the military. They dropped it to a Medicaid rate. Well, all the dentists started freaking out. We got more calls from doctors who said, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. I am done with fighting these PPOs and this thing, and they just keep on lowering my fees, and my costs go up, and I don't know how to compete. And uh, we can compete. So that's a big difference. So, um, but when you're talking about Medicaid and, and PPOs and all that kind of stuff, um, there, there's a lot of consultants that talk about they do uh, PPO fee negotiation with the companies. I imagine if you got 900 plus offices, don't you get to negotiate? Like like on that example oh, yeah. there, the Medicaid, the military, sure. were you able to call them and get a better deal than an individual? Dentist? We dropped out. We dropped out of that one. So you dropped that we one? We dropped out of that one. Yeah, we dropped it. We just said, sorry. And our doctors, what we did was just, we'll give free dentist, dental care to the to the families of the military because it's just not worth it. Because what they'll do is once you start taking a lower fee, everybody can everybody knows what fee you take. And so if you're willing to take a low fee, everyone knows what you're willing to take. And so we're just not willing to take that low fees for our doctors. Our doctors deserve a higher fee. And so we just won't take fees that are too low. And and when you have our size, you have you have more negotiating capability. When you do but, merger and acquisitions and you acquire a practice, um, do you usually uh, go in and renegotiate their PPO fees? Yes, they usually get an uplift. So they're usually they they usually get an uplift when they you know fifteen twenty percent if not higher. So they're they're well that that's, that's we're gonna the get whole a, we're that's gonna the get whole problem. I mean I mean that that means you could I mean that's the whole problem margin because. When, when, when dentists talk about profit, they don't realize, you know, they'll say, okay, the ADA says your average overhead is 65%. So then dentists will say, oh, so then it's 35% profit. And it's like, no, because you, you worked all day, you have a job. You have to pay yeah. yourself what your replacement is. So like in Phoenix, I pay my doctors 25% of adjusted production. So so mm -hmm. when you can go in there and um, and raise the, 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 the PPO negotiation uplift to 20%, if, when you have the office overhead, you get done paying the doctor. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean that that that's just all gravy. I mean, it almost makes it look yeah. like it's you have a fail-proof business model if you can get the PPOs to, to go twenty percent higher. Yeah, unfortunately, the PPOs don't want to. So the solo practitioners are really having a tough time because they're what's their leverage point? I'm going to leave. Well, now what do I do? Because it used to be what? Now it's probably ninety percent PPO. Hardly any indemnity is left. It's all PPO. So people say, well, I don't want to take insurance. Well, if you can do it, great. I mean, I, we just affiliate with somebody who doesn't take any insurance. That's fine. This, there's no problem if you can do it. Not everybody can do it. And so you have to then take a PPO. And if you're with Delta, I mean, Delta is no longer easy on any dentist. They know what they have. They have to compete for an employer. So why would they say, I'm going to give you a higher fee if you're not willing to take my discount fee? So you have to take their discount fee if you want the other one. And dentists don't want to do that. Well, then you're kicked out. And so Delta's like, I can't compete with everybody else out there if you're going to take a higher fee than I can than than I can compete with the PPO down the road. So, so would you? So would it's you, all about employers. So you you'd say, um, what percent of dentists would you say then take PPOs in America? Oh, probably eighty percent. Just eighty percent. 
Uh, maybe it's 90, but I, I don't know the exact number. I'm guessing it's Because 80%. you consider Delta a PPO, correct? Yes, but it, it, they might not. They, they are, probably with that now, it's probably jumped up to 90. You're I mean, I, I got to tell you, 31 years ago um, with Delta. Yeah, it's probably um, 90%. You know, I would go have lunch with the Delta director, Ed Judd, and he was just a great guy. But whatever my fees were, I would send it to him. They'd pay 100% cleaning exam and x-rays, 80% fillings, root canals, and half the crowns of whatever my fee was. And mm -hmm. now they don't care what my fee is. They, they tell me what the fee is. And I'm doing crowns and molar endo for less money uh, 31 years than I was 31 years ago. So mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a more competitive market. But I've seen they make people- it, They make it tough. I, I've seen people go without any insurance, but my God, it's always a super dentist. They're always, they're always intense. They take 500 hours of CE a year. They got all kinds of uh, uh, bells and whistles. I, I, wanna, I wanna focus back to a 915 offices. This is such a amazing pool to learn from. Um, equipment, do your dental offices do better if they have a CAD cam or CBCT or lasers or any, any do you see a return on investment of any of these high-tech investments? The only thing that I've seen a high return on is right now is a scanner. So a digital scanner. That's wow, probably the only gosh, thing that I've seen. I love it. No, oh, I love it. Because because all these people spreading that, you know, you gotta have CAD CAM. Usually they make a living no. off teaching CAD CAM or selling the CAD. They, 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 money is the answer. What's the question? It's incentivized behavior. I just don't see it. I mean, I take a $17 well, we, <laughs> impression with emperor gum, send it to my lab man for a hundred bucks. He makes a crown and you're telling me to buy a $140,000 machine and then spend no. an hour milling it out myself. What, what, do, what do you think of the CAD CAM? Do you, um, well, Dan Spy hates it when I say it. I, don't know, cause, cause I, I was actually talking at, a, at an investor conference and I didn't realize that they were in the room, but I said, you know, we have never purchased one CIRAC. Now we own about a hundred. So we never bought one, but we own a hundred. And guess what? 80% Howard are coat racks. 20% yeah. get used. So you've got 80 out of 100 that never were used, they're dusty, and the 20 that do it, they figure it out, but they're not as productive as other dentists. Now, how, um, uh, we have some one doctor who's extremely good at it, um, but, but very few can do, because if you see one crown, sometimes you have two, now what? You're gonna sit there for that long to get that? Is there some marketplaces that you need to have it? Yes. And the other thing other is, than that, when, it's not efficient. if you came in and saw me, <clears throat> you know, they, they tell you that, you know, that you diagnose it, scan it, prep the tooth, mill it, the whole thing's an hour. You just don't see that in the real world. It's two hours. Not true. And a lot of times yeah, it's three yeah. hours. But if you, Pat Bauer, were in my chair and three hours later, I go to cement that crown and it's not quite right. I don't have the guts to tell you, hey, Pat, can you stay in the chair another hour or two? <laughs> so you're actually emotionally, <laughs> you're emotionally committed to cementing something that you wouldn't cement if your lab man had. Plus, your lab man has made 10,000 crowns and you went to dental school, you're not a lab tech, uh, yeah. And if you think Dental Slice Verona gets mad at you, you should see my advertising team because I own a dental media company and my staff loves to tell me, oh, we lost this advertiser off of dentistry uncensored issue number, you know what I mean? And they, they say, well, you just quit slamming companies. And I say, no, it's dentistry uncensored. I'm telling my homies the truth. And a lot of times I tell you the truth and I lose serious six-figure advertisements uh, in the magazine, and I, I don't care. I don't care what the I mean, you know, the truth. So, what oral scanner do you like? We we uh, our our doctors pick. So everything that we make any decisions on is a is a dentist makes the decisions. We have a committee of dentists, and they picked Itero. So they they it was really between Three Shape and Itero, but Itero really had um, we're the largest Invisalign provider in the world. So we want our doctors to be able to give that product to their to their customers that's what they want for really for function more than for more than looks but it's about the itero can also sell more invisalign so you have the the uh, what do you call it the uh, um, simulator so you can do a simulator in an eight month eight you do a scan and in eight minutes you have a simulation of what their teeth could look at so you're having conversations about function you're having conversations not not only just about Invisalign for looks, you're talking about function and care. And so, plus it works really well with crowns. Every one of their crowns gets sent to Costa Rica and a dentist is um, marking the margins. So they're, they're checking the margins because what every dentist wants and what I want is that crown to just fit 
beautiful right away for that doctor because the most expensive thing in a dentist office is the dentist time, not the lab fee. So if I force them to use a lab that they have to grind away at it, they'll quit every time. So we have what we call diamond trusted labs, probably, I don't know, eight of them, because not one dentist can, or lab can handle all of our, our, our volume. And they get really good pricing, Howard. They get the best pricing and our doctors get a share of the profit. So they're looking for the best crown at the best price. So my job is to make sure they get that. Well, if they use the scanner, they save another $10. So you get, you're, you're getting massive savings on all porcelain crowns that are going in Boom, our error rate went from 5% to less than 1%, our return rate. That's literally what it went. 5% to 1% when you started switching yes. from impressive materials to oral scanning. Yep. With the entire, yep. hey, by the way, uh, I'll be your best friend for life if you get me the CEO of Align Technology on the show, Joseph M. Hogan. How do I, how do I get, the, tell him he's already been on Kramer. I always see him on Kramer, that's a bald, <laughs> crazy guy. He's already used to going I'll, on I'll, shows of bald I'll, crazy. I'll reach out to him. I talked to Joe quite a bit, so I'll I'll reach out to him. Because Joe, Joe and I met. Joe and I we were just reminiscing. Joe and I met three years ago, February at the Winter Conference. So it'll be three years, and uh, he gets it. He gets how he works with Heartland. I struggled working with the line for many years because they just weren't didn't understand DSOs. They didn't understand what we were. Um, but now he knows that we grow our Invisalign by 25% a year. I mean, that means he's doing a lot more volume. That's where he get he wants a partner that he can actually not only try new things, but we're going to get scale and help grow his business. So, yeah, we're very we're very close. Tell him I'm as crazy as Kramer, and he's um, you know I own Dental Town, but I also own Ortho Town. And they're they're dying to they they every time I talk to an orthodontist they always say why don't you podcast Joseph M Hogan, uh, the CEO. <laughs> well, well, let's talk about them for a while because now I'm in I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. My dental office is in Phoenix, and Invisalign has now opened their own store, and it was in the richest demographics. It was the Scottsdale Fashion Center, which is nested between uppity rich Scottsdale and Paradise Valley. And I've now, been there, been to that store. And now Smiles Direct Club has opened up five uh -huh. locations and is about to do an IPO. So what do you um, what do you think about, you know, what do you consider those, um, what do you think of Invis Invisalign's business model of having their own stores? And what do you think about Smiles Direct Club? Um, what, do you, what do you think about those two companies and their business models? Okay, so so first Invisalign, you know, is, is a much superior product. So it, the technology, it's for much more complicated cases. Uh, Smile Direct Club is for the simple cases. It, you know, they used to call it like do-it-yourself ortho. It's a dentist looks at it. That doesn't mean they're perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but there are a lot of people, think about it, they did 250,000 cases and only 20% of the patients qualify so now do the math, Howard. How many people were interested in Smile Direct Club? Because only 200,000 200, or 250,000. It's over a million people requested to have their teeth straightened through Smile Direct Club, and they only did 20% of the cases. So those people have to go someplace, obviously. And they're typically in somebody's dental office today, and nobody's talking to them about ortho. So what they're trying to do is they're just helping people who have simple cases. Now, some dentists would say they're doing cases on people that they shouldn't be doing. I, I'm not a dentist, I can't judge that. So I'll let dentists judge whether they should do, be doing the cases or not. But I can tell you this, a dentist is doing the diagnosis and the dentist is deciding whether or not they get the case or not. I, I know that. Now Invisalign is just a higher end, much better product. I think it's, it's taking over the whole ortho world. Joe believes probably 90% of all cases will be able to be done by Invisalign. I'm in it right now. I have Invisalign on, in. I don't think you can see it, um, but I have another 14 weeks to go, and it's because of my bite. My teeth were straight, but my bite was off, and so I'm I'm I I need my bite to be right. And so for for Joe, it's it's really how do I get more general dentist to take care of patients who are requesting it? Now they're getting in a team. Um, they're doing they're trying to also probably compete with with direct uh, smile direct club but the stores really today are they're trying to get to the invisalign experience to get people to be recognized hey come by we're gonna you're gonna be still referred to a dentist it's not they're not doing the invisalign in the store it's an experience that they're doing and they're gonna send patients that that are really interested in it to dentists 
And so to me, it's a brilliant strategy. You want to compete with, with uh, Smile Direct Club. I think they're in some kind of lawsuit, but that's not for me to talk about. Um, but it's, you know, is there room for both? They probably would both say no, but I would say, yeah, there's probably room for both because it's about getting patients to know that there's, there is help for their teeth and for their function. And that's, that, I mean, that's, in the end, it's about taking care of patients, isn't it? And so if they can take care of patients, I mean, you know, people, why would you pay a lab fee when you can just do it? I don't want brackets. I don't want brackets. Some people do, but I don't want brackets. And so um, if they want them, they can still get them. It's not like it's again, they can't, but so I, we think both of them are fine. I don't, you know, we don't, we don't, uh, we, we have a very good relationship with line. I can tell you that that's, that's our best relationship. Well, and, and what's amazing is, you know, today, you know, the, um, they say that about 5 million Americans are wearing braces right now and 80% of them are between the ages of six and 18. And that's where Dennis, that's where orthodontics was when I was a little kid. When I was a little kid, you know, big families, five, six kids and the most crowded teeth got braces. Well, now people get braces when they're a teenager and then they come back when they're 30. The biggest cosmetic market, every cosmetic guru I've talked to uh, for um, tummy tucks, boob jobs, facelifts. It's always the uh, the divorce uh, remake market. You know, you're you're going back out on the market again. And um, so they're trying to straighten whiter, brighter teeth. Um, so I, I think the upside for do-it-yourself orthodontics SDI or Invisalign stores or general dentists doing Invisalign, I, I just think it, it's amazing. But I want to go back to that technology. Um, a lot of kids come out and they complain they're $400,000 in debt. Then they buy a $150,000 CAD cam, a $100,000 CBCT, and a $100,000 Lanap laser or 125000 with training. Yeah. And they, they make three decisions and they double down their debt. And you are the master. I mean, you're the operations and you're, you're I mean, Rick Workman, it was his idea, his vision, all that, but you're, you're the brains yeah. behind the operations and logistics. And you're basically saying that the only high price thing that you see return on investment is, is an, an Itero oral scanner. And it took your remakes right. from 5% to 1%. And Invisalign yeah. is not covered by Delta's PPO schedule. When I lecture mm -hmm. around the world, I mean, I, I go to countries where the, the government um, reimbursement, like in Malaysia or Cambodia or Indonesia, the, the government reimbursement for Medicaid is so low, but these doctors will run a big Medicaid clinic in Cambodia, losing money on everything because out of that base, they are able to upsell one person a week to Invisalign and one person a week to an implant. Which leads me to my next mm -hmm. question is, um, you know, what are, what are the attributes of your super dentist? Are they more likely to place implants or do Invisalign or molar endo or what? what because the, the question I'm going at is she just walked out of school and she's saying, Pat, hello, I got out of dental school. I didn't do one Invisalign case. I didn't place one implant. I did 15 fillings, two root canals. And she sees <laughs> all these classes to take. What is the return on investment? What, what would you recommend her in order to learn? Is it molar endo? Is it Invisalign? Is it placed in implants, sleep apnea? I mean, there's so much. What would you cover? Well, it's, it's bread and butter first. So, so basically, you have to be able to get a patient out of pain. Uh, we've done a study, Howard. You're gonna you're gonna like this. If a brand new practice doesn't do seven root canals in their first month, that practice will not make it very long. Wow. So think about that. So de novo because has to do happening. seven root canals the first month. If I, if that, it's an early warning system for us. If you're not doing root canals we've got a massive problem because what then what happens is they go tell everybody and their friends they don't take care of you, you stay in pain, you're done. And so we have to make sure they know how to do root canal. So when they first start, when that class of 170 starts in July, we have them in Effingham for a week, approximately less than a week, and they're getting endo training from the likes of Dr. Bruder out of uh, New York's um, Stony Brook. Um, people like that that are giving them hands-on experience. We, we just had a whole class. I think there was probably 30 people at the Cavo or no, uh, Dense Flies um, a new system in Charlotte where they do hands-on endo. Um, and uh, we use their whole their whole training set. So Dense Flies so it's getting... has an endo, um, hands-on endo place in Charlotte? Yes. Yes, either that or it's Cavo. No, I, I think I think. Well, Cavo's, Cavo's out of uh, uh, LA, Orange County. 
Yeah, yeah. Then these, yeah, these guys are these guys. Char they have an op. They have a new place in Charlotte. I think it's Densply. Yeah, that's Densply in Charlotte. And so, and and so, he, so here's the deal. You know, think about where Rick started. Rick started in Effingham, Illinois. Where was the closest Rook Canal and Adonis for him? St. Louis. St. Louis. So he had to figure it out. So our whole basis, you know, some people start with HMO. We started with, we have to create super GPs. They've got to be able to do everything they can possibly do so that a patient is taken care of. I don't expect him to do complex surgery, complex endo, redos. I, I don't expect him to do that. But if they aren't willing to say, no, I'll take care of a patient, they're probably not a match for us at some point. They're going to go, you know, I, I don't want to do endo. Well, then let's bring an endodontist in. Okay, happy to do that. As long as we don't, we're taking care of people, that's what, it, in the end, that's what the community wants. And if you don't do that, you're going to suffer in your own practice. Now, when you get older, like we affiliate with a lot of doctors who don't do endo, then they get here and go, why don't I do endo? Why did I stop doing endo? Because it was nobody was there to support you. Well, we work with Densply, Tulsa, and all of their reps know exactly, go into a Heartland office, because it's gonna help you. So we have a whole system to say, okay, this doctor needs help with, with endo. We get the rep and our, our clinical person working with that doctor to help them take care of patients, not to berate them, not to, you suck. It's, well, if you're struggling, let's help you. Not So it's different than dental school, it's not, I don't know your experience, but Rick talks about his experience at dental school. It wasn't that pleasant for him. So for, for us, though, it's about being helping them um, take care of their patients. And does it work 100% of the time? No, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to work most of the time. So, do you know, um, Tulsa Dental was started by Ben Johnson in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Did you ever meet him? Never did. He is nope. so damn cool. He started Tulsa Dental Products in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But anyway, he bought the film of the old of the first root canal ever filmed um and it was on um um by dr m l ryan md dds in new york city in 1917 and i posted that on dental town it has over 3300 views and what's amazing is nothing changed i mean 1917 <laughs> it's now 2019 and it was find all the canals get them all cleaned out and then obturate it. And, and how do they fail? You don't find all the canals. You don't clean it out. And when millennials tell me that they don't like molar endo, I say, well, you know what? I had four boys in 60 months and one of them got up every night for 30 minutes. Now I didn't like that, but you suck it up buttercup. <laughs> I mean, think, 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 think about how, I mean, Homo sapien is a 2 million year old species where they think 107 billion of them have lived and there's seven billion of them alive today. How many of those 107 billion humans that came and gone had to do things they didn't like for us to get here? <laughs> like spending the whole- I come winter. from a family of 16. I can assure you, I did a lot of things. 16? <laughs> there were 16 kids yeah. in your family? I'm the 14th of 16, yeah. You, you, have, to so, be, you yeah. have to be Catholic or Mormon? Catholic. Catholic. <laughs> oh, so are you Irish too? No, no, German. 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 Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I just read a demographic thing. America is basically four tribes. It's German, Irish, African American, and Latino. Those four tribes. In fact, do you know you're German? Did you know that when the United States uh, did their constitution, um, imperial math beat out uh, metric by the Germans only by one vote? And the, oh, no, really? no, no, that was two votes. But the language English only beat out the votes by German by one vote. So we were one no. vote away from speaking German and two votes away for being on metric. So three votes, just three more wow. votes. I did not know We would that. have been Germans huh. doing uh, metric. And, and, and it was in the year 2000, I was in uh, at MBA school at ASU and that, that uh, Mars mission crash landed and ASU was so embarrassed because the ASU development team did it in Imperial Math miles and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory did it in metric, like intelligent people. And then when it started to enter, it froze because it couldn't crunch, you know, miles and kilometers and crash a $200 million mistake. And the country still at that time, that day, they should have switched to metric. And here it is 2019 <laughs> and we're still teaching kids. Um, so, um, gosh, this, this is so amazing. Um, I, I have another historical question that I think you may have perspective on. In 1900, there were no specialties and a doctor did everything from amputate your leg to deliver your baby. And now the year 2019, the MDs have 58 specialties, the dentists have nine. And you see some of these <clears> young kids that think 
They want to be super dentists. They want to do molar endo and place implants and do pediatric dentist. They just want to do everything the, the, like a super dentist. And, and it seem, do you really think it's good advice to be a super dentist and do everything? Or again, let's go back over that list. Um, you said uh, endo, get them out of pain. What what else would you recommend? Extractions, so, so basic oral surgery. I'm not saying they should be super, you know, um, you know, oral surgeon type surgeons. But if, if you know of anybody that's ever been on a mission trip, they come back and they now know how to take out teeth and they're not afraid. So I think every dentist should go on a mission trip and take out teeth because you become unafraid to take out somebody's tooth. And that, that's a real service for patients. They are looking for somebody to help them get them out of pain. And so that's just one aspect. That doesn't mean they have to be take out thirds. They don't have to do complicated surgery but they have to be able to take care of people that are in pain because dent, what we do know, Howard, and you know this, patients don't want to fly, go all over for their care. They want you to take care of them to the ability that you can, clearly. And so we're not, we don't, when we say super GP, I don't want them to be a super everything, but they, okay, Howard, 170 brand new doctors in Effingham, Illinois, this July, what percent will say, I want to do implants? What do you think? All of them. 100. 100%. How many have ever done an extraction or an endo? None of Very them. few. So you can't, this is surgery. You want to put something in somebody's bone, but you won't do an extraction or you won't do endo? You've got to get used to it. So we've started a whole continuum that starts with surgery, that starts with you being able to, you know, help get some bone in there and 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 do some real surgery with, with mentors that are looking over your shoulder before you're just doing implants. And I won't put a CPT scan in any office unless they're doing 50. If you're doing 50 implants, then okay, I'll put a CBC. But otherwise, on the hopes, I remember talking to a very large implant company and they said, we'd love to work with Heartland. Uh, let's start talking about what we would do. Got, first thing we got to do is put a CBCT scan in every office. I said, well, it's a non-starter. We might as well just be done with the meeting. You want me to spend that much money on the hopes they do implants? That's that, that The return is just not even clear. Now, if you can help them do implants, what's the easiest time to sell somebody on an implant? When they just are losing a tooth. So, but if you're already missing a tooth, well, that's a harder sell. And so the guy who does the most implants for us at about four or five hundred a year, I think it's four fifty. Doesn't have a CBT CT scan because he does almost all of them are immediate placement implants, and so he knows where everything is. He he can figure it out, and that's not the standard. The standard isn't you have to have a have CBT scan. Have him come on my show. Read any books. Have him come on my What's show. That? Has he been on my show? <laughs> Oh, probably not. He's a pretty quiet guy. <laughs> e email, email him and CC me, Howard, at dentaltown.com because I, I got to remind people, like, the greatest implant legend in the world, like Carl Mesh, had placed 25,000 implants before they even invented a CBCT. And, right. and and so, you know, when you say you have to... And sometimes so, so it gets in their way is what I've been told. So. so so let's go back to that. So you're a bit... When I asked you about equipment, you said um, an uh, iTerra oral scanner. So uh, you're, yep. you, don't, you don't routinely put CBCTs in offices? No, oh, no, no. Only if they're already doing implants and, or if they've, you know, proven that they've done implants. If it's a doctor who says, no, I've already done this is, and I have the data, so I know who's doing it. And uh, yeah, then if they're going to do more and more complex cases, absolutely. But if you even talk to them, they go, I don't use it as much as I probably should because I've done them now and I know what I'm doing. But if it's going to be a complex case, yes. But these guys... They have to get good at surgery first before we, we do yeah, it. Yeah, but if you say again, that, you'll just get doctor. beat up. This isn't Pat making this decision. These are doctors. So I'm looking yeah. at doctors and saying, tell me what works. Tell me. This is not Pat Bauer or Heartland making these decisions. It's doctors that are making these decisions that are deciding whether or not they need it. And, and I'm just saying, okay, you've proven to me that you don't need it unless you need, and, unless you're going to do that many. And young, These are their guidelines. And youngins out there, when you're hearing a lecturer speaker saying the CBCT is standard of care, I mean, do you raise your hand and say, do you make money from the CBCT company? When you read an article in a magazine that says you got to have a CBCT at standard of care, do you ask them, uh, did you give this magazine money to advertise this promotional material? I mean, come on. I mean, um, you know, it seemed, it, Warren Buffett said it the best. He, he taught in my freshman business class, I went to Creighton University in 1980, oh, wow. and the, oh, the, wow. the chairman of the deal knew Warren Buffett. He was the, the Oracle of Omaha, and he came by and gave us a guest lecture. And I'll never forget, he said two things that just knocked me out of my chair. He said, if you can't explain to me your business, 
on a on a five by seven index card with a number two pencil. He goes, "You don't know what you're doing, and I'm not investing in you." And in, and then the second thing he said that knocked me off the chair. He said, "95 percent of the most elite CEOs, the the CEOs of the S and P 500, 95 percent go to work every day, trying their hardest to take profit earned." and destroy it in reinvestment and all these crazy schemes. He goes, only 5% of them take their money off the table and say, this is our profit dollars. And dentists are just always, you know, they haven't paid off their student loans. They haven't paid off their house. They haven't paid off uh, their car. They haven't, they're, they're in debt and they're, and they're getting five-year leases on CAD cams and CVCTs and lasers. It's just like they got a, a DDS degree. It must stand for just wants to spend money and get in more debt and more. <laughs> maybe it's debt service, doctor of debt service. That's what a DDS is. DDS um, is a... I'm going to write that down for you. Oh, well, Howard, you know, we, we affiliate with a lot of doctors, so we see a lot of <laughs> profit and loss, I can assure you. Yeah, and it's just like, um, and, and then, yeah, and then another thing, you know, they talk about their $400,000 student loans. Well, a kid is 200000 so you, you were 16 kids in your family? Yeah. We'll just have 14 instead of 16, and you say got your 400000 <laughs> back. Um, what, what do you think the average doctor pays on a divorce? Yeah. Um, Oh, uh, well, I have no idea. A well, lot, I'm sure. What would you guess? I mean, it's got it's over a million. Oh, I'd guess seven fifty to a million. Yeah, seven fifty a million. So I mean, you know, every time I listen to someone talk about financial planning, they talk about everything but financial planning. They're talking about e ETFs and this and commission free broker, and it's like that. That has nothing to do with financial planning. You know, if you don't get married, you'll never get divorced. If you don't have a kid, if you don't get married, and you don't have a kid. <laughs> All you got to do is is work at the IHOP and you're going to be a millionaire someday. I mean, uh, you know, uh, that financial planning is don't get married or if you are, don't get divorced. And um, a quarter of the baby boomers had no children and they say a third of the millennials are going to have no children. And uh, my gosh. Um, um, so anyway, um, so back to your super dentist attributes, you were saying, you know, bread and butter success offices are getting you out of pain. A new practice must use seven root canals. Yep. It's first month, it's yep. gonna fail. Extractions, oral surgery. Anything else come to your mind? Yep. Root canals, extractions, um, oral surgery? I mean, basic crown and bridge. You know, also being able to do just even, uh, you know, how do you take care of a kid? How do you, what do you do when you have, a lot of people don't wanna see kids, but you're going to, especially if you're in a brand new office. And so how do you deal with them? So we talk about that. Um, you know, just basic composites. How do you do it with, you know, we do a smile design, so we call it a, a uh, they have, everybody has the opportunity to do it. So we do a lecture and it's by Mayasaki, Mayasaka, Mayas I think it's Dr. Mayasaki. I think he does it. Um, and he, he basically teaches them and we do live hands-on. So last year, I think we did, I wanna say 180 live cases where we had mentors, labs there, but it's not just about doing a smile design, it's called our aesthetic continuum. It's about how to do it with the right composite material. It really gives them the, the ability to understand what they're doing with the, with the patient from a whole mouth perspective. Because they come out of school thinking, okay, I've got a MODBL here, what am I gonna do? I got, I, they're only doing surfaces. And so we've got to teach them to not think about surfaces, think about the patient, think about what you're really doing, how you're doing it. And that's a transition from what they where, where they came from. So their whole system is try to set up how to do that. So they have that continuum that they that they can do and it's regional. So they can do it in their own region and not have to travel very far. So we do that um, too. Rick said, well, so uh, one of the greatest podcasts I ever did was with Rick Workman. It was, uh, I'd say, it was right when I started um, doing podcasts. He was the first guy I called and he was so busy. It took, uh, uh, took a month for him to come on. I think he was episode 37. Uh, but he was saying back then that another secret uh, sauce you guys have is a call center that there's 168 hours in a week and most dentists only answer their phone 32 hours a week. Do you think your call center is part of your secret sauce? It is now. What we realized, uh, Howard, is we we were not answering 39% of our phone calls. So we did a study and we released into 5,000 phone calls using Whisper technology, which is just basically um, you can track the the call and what who the demographics of the patient are. Well, I found out from all the experts who all that's all they do. That's the average in America. So we were average 35%? At answering our phone. 39. 39% 39. of the time okay. we were not answering the phone. Um, and so what we are a decentralized company. So I don't centralize billing. I don't I don't centralize anything that to get in between the doctor and the patient. 
So I don't want to ever get in between that relationship. That relationship is with the patient, is with the doctor, not Heartland. So we don't see patients, the doctor does. And so, but my customer's a doctor and if they're not answering the phone, they're wasting marketing dollars. And so what we do is we have a rollover call center. If they don't answer it, we answer it in Effingham. We now have 185 people in Effingham who, when the phone rings, it comes up in front of them where I have their Dentrix in their office and their demographics and I answer it like I'm sitting at their front desk. And so they don't know that I didn't that they didn't get the office. Now, if they ask, am I at the office? We tell them the truth, but they don't even need to know. And so we can schedule, I just heard today, month to date, we've scheduled 16,000 new patients out of that call center from phones not being answered. Now we answer it on Sunday. Eight is that, that 16,000 in a month or period? Less than a month because it's only, it's only January 29th. So that was through yesterday. So we still have two more days. We think we'll get up to probably 17,000. We, we honestly, we answer a lot of phone calls. We answer on average 11 to 14 calls per office per day. Say that again. 11 calls per office per day are answered there. After and so how that's many, how many after calls. How many, rings? Just, how many rings? To, three rings. Three rings. 11 calls per dentist per day or per office? Per office per, per day. day. Now, there's some that I get, per, some I get 40, some I get two. So it depends on how the size of the office, but. You know, and then we charge we charge that office a per call and a monthly fee. So they have to. What, what they, do you charge it's them? It's cheaper per call? than a BA. What what? A dollar forty three a call. You only $1. charge them a dollar forty three to answer a phone call. Well, I'm not trying to make money. I'm just trying. <laughs> I'm not trying to make money out of them. I'm Can just I roll to cover over my, my cell phone to you? <laughs> I want to roll over my cell phone to you. I'm the dumbest <laughs> dentist in the world. I've given my business card to every at every lecture, so every dentist yes. has my cell phone number. And my email. Oh my god! That wasn't smart. Enough. I mean, I always love it when I talk to him, but then, I, but anyway. So you charge him a dollar forty-three if after three rings it rolls over your call center, yeah. and you got one hundred eighty-five people and scheduling seventeen thousand appointments a day. So a so, month. A month. Yeah. So that's seventeen new patients. Now that's also we also are scheduling, re, you know, recare. We're answering billing questions. We're taking we're taking credit cards. I mean, we're we're basically taking the burden off the off the business assistants who are dealing with patients who are coming at them. And so the whole process, the the the, the really smart offices go, okay, I can either hire another one, but that's expensive. This is cheaper if you guys help me. Now think about that. You're in your morning huddle. The phone's ringing. You don't have to worry about it because somebody's going to answer it. You know what? The, what's the number one number most amount of calls, time and day of week that we can't even answer, come close to answering all the phone calls? What time and day of the week do you think it is that we can't even come close to answering the number of phone calls? We can't even staff it properly. Monday morning at eight o'clock. Friday at three p.m. Monday at eight is second. Friday at three so p.m. Because everybody's closing. Everybody's closed. So I know. nobody, I mean, our office, people don't want to be open. And so we answer, and, and we're open on, we're open in, in the evening on Friday, we're opening every evening during the week, and then we're open on Saturday and Sunday. The and call we answer center. the phone. Yep, the call center, yep. So so what are your, what are your hours of your call center then? Monday through, Monday through? Uh, Monday, I think it goes six or seven, I think it might open at six to like eight o'clock at night central. And then, because uh, we have some West Coast, offices and then friday i think they're only open till six or seven but they start at six and then saturday they're eight to like four sunday eight to two and sunday eight to two um that so you know one of the things i always talk about these people that are um um scared to open up their own office you know it, what they're really afraid of is just commitment and hustling i mean i, I graduated from dental school uh, married my high school sweetheart, dropped four boys in 60 months, had student loan. <laughs> my dad wouldn't give me a dime because he said if he gave me a dime, I'd be a loser. And and basically, um, basically what did I do? I worked seven to seven Monday through Saturday for a decade and got mm -hmm. debt free and rich. And these guys, they come out of school, $400,000 student loans. They want to open Monday through Thursday, eight to five, not do molar endo. I don't like blood. I just want to do bleaching, bonding, veneers, and Invisalign. It's like, okay, well, go call Walt Disney and tell him to star you in a movie. 
Uh, because well, here's the deal, Howard. Here's the, that's the, this is the beauty of our system. So our system allows doctors to have that flexibility without the risk. So for our doctors, they can work 36 to 30, 40 hours a week and not have to worry about things because some doctors don't want to be you. They don't want to work seven to seven and the millennials want a lifestyle. And so we're a perp, when all these people are hating DSOs, it's like, seriously, we're just an answer. I don't hate solo practitioners. I love them. It's just our, it's another way for doctors to be able to practice the way they want to practice. That There's nothing wrong with that. They don't want to work seven to seven Monday through Friday. They just don't want to. And they shouldn't have to if they don't want to. Now, if they do, God bless them. I'll support them. If a doctor says, Pat, I just always wanted to open my practice. Well, then let's get us, let, get, let's get us you ready because you better be ready when you're going to start your own practice. So let's help you because you're always going to be an alumni of Heartland. You'll always be an alumni. So let's make it work. Let's make it so that it's a smooth transition so we don't get hurt, you don't get hurt, and you can open your practice the way, as long as you're not going to take our patients, which is, they won't do. So, you, um, are, so you, are you still running on Dentrix? Yeah, still on is Dentrix. Dentrix. We have or Dentrix that, Enterprise? Dentrix. We have uh, we, 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 we use what we call DX1, which collects all the data every night from the offices, but they're on their own standalone Dentrix system out there. We have tools that we can you know, interact with them, change fees that with them. That just so blows we can my mind because you're in Effingham where Eaglesoft is. How, how did the mothership of, of uh, Heartland <laughs> and Eaglesoft in the well, same damn town not how did that happen? Well, we were very well. We were very good friends with Scott Cavus, and I remember when Scott Craig now his brother now works for us. He's our CIO um, and Left Patterson. But Scott, when he when he when we were looking for what was his last name? Two thousand Cavus Scott Cavus. He started C A B A S K A B B E S. And he, he uh, started EagleSoft and sold it to Patterson. He actually ran Patterson Dental for probably right. two or three years in Minnesota. But Scott basically came to us and said, "Look, guys." we're not ready for a group practice. And this was back in 2000, I wanna say, probably around 2000 when we switched to Dentrix. And uh, he said, you know, I'd rather be your friends than you be up, because I don't think we can handle your business. And so that was, it was just a very honest discussion. And Scott, well, I mean, we are, we, we, Scott ended up on our board for five years. So we have a great relationship with Scott and he's hired his brother, uh, Craig, who, who worked and started Eaglesoft with him. And uh, so it, it, it's just, that was why. And, and even now, now we're working, we're working really very close because uh, KKR owns internet brands and internet brands um, owns all of those other smaller practice, so those smaller things and now own part of Henry Shine One, which is Dentrix. So we're lucky enough to have a relationship um, with internet brands, which is um, now owns Henry Shine One with uh, Henry Shine. So. It's a it's a great relationship. Well, you just walked into that that uh, subject. Um, let's uh, continue <laughs> there because I um I was blown away. Um, well, KKR. I mean, that's one of the biggest um, f uh, investment houses in the world. What would you call them? Private equity or private equity? Private I would equity. Say private equity. And my gosh, I mean, let me. Uh, t I mean, these guys bought WebMD for two point eight billion. They bought you guys, they bought Demand Force, Office Site, Sesame Communications, Heartland Dental, Dental Plans, eHealth Forms, HealthBoards.com, FitDay, Vein Directory. What are they, what is their, um, what, are, what are they doing? And, and, and how well, is your, I mean, and your, how's your new partnership? So originally, um, one of your greatest investments was a, uh, a teacher's fund in, in Canada. And then they yep. sold, they didn't sell all your stock, but they sold a big chunk yep. of it. Uh, to KKR mm -hmm. uh, from, the, from the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. Um, so what, what's going on there? What, why, why, does K, well, I, why is KKR I, buying WebMD and Heartland and all these dental companies? Well, I think they're looking for good investments. So if you think about what the future is, so, so for us as an example, they looked at us in 2012 when, when Ontario Teachers Pension Plan um, invested in us. And they didn't get the chance to invest. So they watched us for five years and we met, we've known them now and we were friends with them. And so when teachers was trying to decide, okay, what do we do? We said, well, at least let's KKR take a look as well because we know them, they've been around, they understand our business. And they absolutely said, we really want to invest in the business. And KKR is, or Tontier teachers kept a 16% interest in the company. And so what KKR is doing is they're saying, look, we know good operators when we see them. I hate to say it that way, but Rick and I have been around a long time. 
Our business model has not changed. They saw what we said we'd do in 2012 and where we are, and it was actually the end of 2012, beginning of 2013, and where we were in 2018. And so we closed in, in April, but they basically said, you guys did what you said you were going to do, and your returns on what you do, and your doctor satisfaction, and your patient satisfaction, and everything that you believe in and do, you've actually done. And so we want a safe inv investment that we think can grow, because if you think about it, we're 1% of the market and we're the biggest in the whole market. Right, that's so much upside. And so there's so much, there's so much, there, there's so much of a need for groups like ours to do it well. There's people that don't do it well, I'm sure. Um, but to do it well, and this market, if you know they bought HCA, they, they look at things that they think that can grow. Um, and and they're not looking to flip us in five years. They, they want us for a little bit longer uh, longer than that. Their typical hold, again, I can't speak for KKR, I'm sure the information's out there, um, but I've been told they, their typical is seven years, and so us, they wanna keep rate 10 years plus because it's a very safe growth model that they don't have to you know worry about us designing the next iPhone you know, to compete with all of these different people. We're in a, in a very nice market that do the right thing we believe for dentists and can continue to grow. So they're looking at dental. I think they're looking at dental as what a great opportunity. What a great and what investment. What does KKR own of Harlan? You said you said the Ontario. About 50-ish, 50, 50, 53%, something like that. 53? Yep, something in that range. Huh. And um, so, so um, KKR owns uh, Heartland and Henry Shine One, um, which, uh, which owns uh, so many things. What, what, what's your thoughts on Henry Shine One? Well, I think they're, they're trying to figure out how to help dentists um, get patients is what I would think. I mean, if you think about how do you interact with uh, in this digital world with Dentrix, with uh, Demand Force, with the web uh, site deal, with uh, the dentalplans.com with how do you interact with patients these days? And so what they're, what I think, and again, I, I don't know them well enough to know because you should ask them, but it seems to me that they're trying to help doctors who use Dentrix um, have a way to contact and, and internet interact with patients so that they can get more patients. I mean, if you think about it, that's what internet brands started in was in the auto business. And uh, they basically were able to be referral uh, generators for for uh, different car dealers. And so that's that's their start, that's where they started. And uh, if you think about WebMD, how many hits a, a month do you think they get? I mean, they get millions. And so how many are dental questions? A lot of those. And so those patients need to go someplace and they have the demographic information. If you think about what they know about you, Howard, whenever you get on a website, they know who exactly who you are, how much money you spend, what you spend it on, what you look for. And so they they know you like a and me like a book, and so they're going to send you information that you, they think what you'd be interested in. So, so it's 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 a it's the whole thing. It's a Facebook phenomenon. I don't know. I'm I am the least technical person. I know how to use my computer. So then if they it. own if they own over fifty percent of Heartland, is technically Heartland part of uh, Internet Brands? No, no, we're cut. I get. I would call us sister companies. We're not. I mean, we have a good relationship because the same owner owns it, but the way they're set up, it's a separate ownership. There's no ownership in between, but, does, but does, we are sister companies. Does, does internet brands own? Cousins, I guess. Uh, it would be a cousin then of Henry Schein? Yeah. Well, internet brands now um, bought 30% of Henry Schein Dentrix. So they own 30% of, uh, I think that was public information. So Dent Dentrix um, at, combined with internet brands to make Henry Schein won, which I think uh, Henry, Internet Brands is a minority owner. So Dentrix is still, Henry Schein is still the main owner. So so Internet Brands owns what percent of uh, Dentrix? This is a guess only. I think right. it's 30%, but I know it's a minority. Well, 48.7% um, of all statistics are made up. So we'll just go there with, you uh, go. We'll go with 30. <laughs> so are you friends I with- I on stage a lot. <laughs> do, do you meet um, Robert uh, Briscoe, the CEO of Internet Brands? Yeah, yeah super guy, super- Tell him to come right. on the show and tell us his vision. Do you think he'd do it? 
I don't know. I can ask him. Yeah, <laughs> ask Bob is, him. Bob's honestly, he's honestly brilliant. Is the only word I have. He, for him. He's a genius. Absolutely he's brilliant. a genius. But I, he I is. And, and I always tell these dentists. I mean, don't be, don't think in fear and scarcity. I mean, when when my, my dad would open up a Sonic, I remember he would be so scared because then the next thing you know, uh, McDonald's would open up across the street. And then he learned right. over the years that the more restaurants on the corner, the busier he ever got, because instead of being out in the middle of nowhere, now that intersection was an end destination where families were just going to go to First Street in Maine and they might swing through three different. Um, but anyway, so don't think in fear and scarcity. And what you should be thinking of is when McDonald's owns up across the street and you see that 40 percent of their 60 percent of their sales are through the drive through and you own a hamburger joint across the street and have a drive through. You learn from the best. Don't be afraid yes. of. By the way, did I ever tell you my Rick Workman McDonald's story? I think, yo, know, I know it because I was oh, there when God. you guys did it. I think he was so, actually. You, I think I was, it was afterwards. That was so cool. He knew I grew up in Sonic, and my dad. I he wanted me to go in with him, and I just told him, I said, Dad, I, I don't want to make hamburgers, and I go to work with my dad, the love of my life, but I go to work with my next door neighbor, Kenny Anderson, who's still a dentist after fifty-one years. And he was taking wow. x-rays through teeth and doing root canals. And I, I, I wrote my dental school in the, in the sixth grade, telling him I wanted to go to dental school. And, um, <laughs> and, he, and so then he thought maybe it was a dad thing. So he took me over to Dan Carney and Dan Carney is like, oh yeah, let's get you in a pizza. And he even got me, even back then it was hard to get a McDonald's franchise. And he, he met me uh, with the McDonald's people and, and uh, I could have got into that, but I, I just want to be a dentist. And uh, but anyway, when I was in uh, visiting Rick in Effingham, you were there, and um, my gosh, I was telling about uh, you and Cordia Harrington. I think it was you and Cordia Harrington and Rick Workman. And I was telling and him how Cordia, Cordia is now the bun lady and makes all the buns for all the McDonald's in the world. Oh my! Did you know God. that? No. Yeah, she is now the please, bun lady. Please she's tell me she's Tennessee. single. She is not. Oh my gosh! I finally, I finally was gonna marry Bun Woman, and then she's like, but, but it was so cool because she was. I just love passion people. You can tell their passion. And I told him, I said, man, it's been so long since I worked at a McDonald's. I'd love to go back there and see their new technology. And she's like, come on down. We went down there. It was like midnight and back there. And I told her I always wanted to cook my own uh, Big Mac, so I got to cook my own Big Mac. She was so damn cool. But her passion is contagious. Um, just, just, you just got to go for it. Uh, oh, so, so, um, are, are you got any more time or are you out of time and wishing I, I actually have a call at three o'clock, which I have one minute. So, I'll, okay. One I'll, minute, uh, one minute. What I'll, is okay. a million different stories on overhead? What do you like to see on overhead? And please don't mix the cost of the dentist with the profit dollars employed from having capital invested in a dental office. What would you, well, would our you whole think? comp model, our whole compensation model is set up that the average practice in America has about 64% overhead, not, not counting the doctor. And so, excuse me. Yes. Not counting the doctor. So we expect that that practice, um, should, if you have a better than 64% overhead, then you should be, you should make more than an average per doctor because you're giving me average overhead. So that we think that the hygiene um, should be at, uh, it should be eight, six, and six. So that's 20% of, of comp labor, not counting what, what taxes. Mean, what do you mean eight, 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 and six? Eight percent of the revenue, eight percent of the revenue hygiene, six dental assistants, six business assistants. So that's 20. Okay, so so if you're below dental, twenty, dental, you dental, have a healthy practice. So high, so total overhead sixty four percent, hygiene eight percent, assistant um, six percent, six percent, dental assistant six percent, business assistant six percent. Anything underneath that is is less than twenty percent uh, of staff salaries. That is what we would call thrive. Then your lab right now, our lab fees and supplies are under nine percent. Lab so five and, and supplies. Four should be under nine five for labs and four for supplies the average practice we practice we look at for for supplies is about seven and a half percent and we bring that down to four maybe even lower four less than four um, and then on lab we typically see eight to ten and that goes down to about five okay so hygiene eight percent assistant six percent business admin six percent total staff salary should be what 20 percent or lower 20% or lower. And how do you get the word thrive out of that? Well, thrive is just, we, we that, that's when you're a thriving practice. If okay. you have less than I, th I thought the THRI. Right, no. So no, the lab no, no, 5% no, supplies 4%. What about dentist pay? Dentist pay is, well, we pay them 25% of their personal collections. 
And so plus 50% of the profits above 16% of the revenue. So I can go slower there, but plus 50% uh, of net income over 16%. Yep. So we keep 16%, the PC does, and the doctor gets 25% of what they do in that particular practice. And then the PC splits the profit with that doctor 50, 50 after the, after the 16%. Wow. And uh, so any so other- our average doctor, our average doctor makes about 32% of what they do, of what their personal uh, net production is. Um, but they can make up to 40 plus percent if they're a profitable practice. So, it, it, but, it, but it depends on what you're delivering. So we, we really look at it as, it's, Howard, it's the same way a, a, a solo practitioner is paid. You get paid for your dentist and then you get paid to be the owner. So in the same way, we get paid to be a dentist and then you get to be paid to be the leader of the practice owner. So if you think like an owner, you'll make more money. So it's the same concept as a dentist and a solo practitioner. Cause a lot of people t say, Oh, these DSOs, they give people incentives and it's just a bunch of crap. That's how every solo practitioner in the world is paid, but they think that they're paid differently. No, you're paid as the dentist and you're paid as the owner. Which one are you going to get? And we do it basically the same way. It's the same model. It's same what you just mentioned earlier. Final question. What should we name this podcast? So that, I mean, I, 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 I could say Patrick Bauer, president CEO of Heartland Dental, which has 1,915 offices. But what I want to do is get it to where they, they, they can learn from someone like you. I mean, you, you run more dental offices than anyone in the world. So I'd say lessons, lessons. Lessons from a DSO. How about that? <laughs> lessons they from go, what the, a bunch how, about, shit. <laughs> how about, how about lessons from the largest DSO with Patrick Bauer? Yeah. Should Something we do that? Like that? Okay. Yeah. Well, hey, seriously, you can play with it. seriously, it was it was hey, just a huge honor point. that you would take your time to to talk to my me and my homies, and uh, my gosh, if you can get Robert Briscoe and uh, Joe Hogan, that'd be amazing because I'm on a, I just want to get the biggest stars in dentistry down into their YouTube and their their phone so they can just make better decisions. If they make if they can make yeah. better, faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost decisions, um, they're gonna live happy ever after. Absolutely, they will. And right, I, have, I have the most respect for you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks a lot, Howard.